Hello, Augies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with another episode of Ask Dave. Today's question comes from Jeff Wittern, KE0KRO, who attends almost all of the live streams that I've put on. He seems to enjoy them. He's an optical engineer that makes contact lenses for a living. Now, he says he has lots of old radios and it, that he's collected over the years, but he's using both an ICOM 7300, which is just like the uh, rig that we have for the reference station, and he's also using a Kenwood TS590SG. Both radios have outstanding receivers, and they do. They're very good. Okay, but his problem is simple. He lives in South Dakota, right in the middle of the country, and he is unable to get very many DX stations. This is a common complaint for people who live in the middle of the country, like I do. It's hard to get DX. So let's talk about, first of all, what is DX? Uh, how do we talk to hams? Uh, and so on. DX means a ham in another country other than the U.S. Now, technically, it means a ham who is from an area that's listed in the DXCC, or DX Century Club, uh, award, and there's an official list of countries. And as it turns out, the continental United States is a country, Alaska's another country, Hawaii's another country, Puerto Rico's another country. Um, you've got uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands are another country. You've got lots of different places that are uh, different countries. And uh, if you want to work DX, it means working a, a station uh, outside of the continental U.S. in this case, okay, because he's in South Dakota. Now, I want to uh, talk a little bit about DX. First of all, it's... Yes, you can be self-taught, but it's nice if you can start with something like this. This is a, an older book, The Complete DXer. This is the first edition. They're up to a third edition in 2003. Unfortunately, it's no longer in print. But go to your club and see if you can find somebody who has this. Borrow it and read it. It will really jumpstart you on being able to work DX. There are some considerations in working countries and other stations. First of all, although most of the ham bands around the world are the same-ish, they are not identical. For example, hams in, uh, over in Europe have different frequencies available to them on 40 meters and so on, although the 20 meter band seems pretty universal around the world. Some DX is easier to work than others. Now, if we're going to work this on HF, we're going to work it directly. We're not going through the internet or anything like that. That means that the signal has to bounce off the ionosphere. Let me draw a picture here. Okay, here's the Earth. And about 75 to 300 miles above it, which is, if we were to draw it to scale, would be about right there. Um, but we'll just draw it up here. Is something called the ionosphere. Ion, O, sphere. Okay, it's a layer of the atmosphere that's very, very, very sparse. And it's easily ionized by ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun makes this conductive up here. There's both positive and negative charged particles. A standard HF radio wave will come out of here and be refracted by the ionosphere, bounce off the surface, again be refracted by the ionosphere, bounce off the surface, refracted by the ionosphere, and lo and behold, there's your DX station already. Now, there are a couple of problems with this. First of all, the ionosphere is not nice and smooth, like I uh, wrote it here. Second, if your frequency is too high, your signal will exit the atmosphere. If your signal's at too high a level, it'll exit the atmosphere and go into space. 
Uh, second, this might be over here in the daytime and this the nighttime. And the problem with that is that the ionosphere changes whether it has uh, light or not on it. Every one of these hops you lose signal, okay? Remember that your signal might cover a huge area on the earth over here. And the DX station has to hear you. And, and I know this is hard to believe, but the signal coming back, oh, I just used that color, let's try pink. The signal coming back could take a different path and might be hard to uh, receive. So sometimes you can receive a DX station, but they can't hear you. So all of these forces need to line up in such a way that you can hear the uh, DX station. Now, let's go over here. I want to show you something on a map, okay? This is a piece of software by a Freet software called DX Atlas. And you can look at the world in quite a variety of ways. As it is right now, the sun is almost directly overhead for those of us here in Colorado. Uh, well, it would be directly overhead here in Mexico, but um, we're right about here. But uh, Jeff is in up here in W0 land. Now we're used to looking at maps of the world like this and we would think the DX is here um, or down South America or something like that. But we need to look at a better view, okay? Here is Jeff right uh, here in South Dakota, okay? So we're gonna pull this map down. Now where is the DX? It, well, there's DX in Canada. Here's Hawaii. Look how far away Hawaii suddenly seems. And down here is Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands. Uh, Cuba has a lot of hams. Uh, they're Mexican hams. Not a huge number of them, but there's a few who are very active. And then there's South America down here. Note that the direction from here to South America is not south. It's southeast. Now, you've got, let's just talk about where hams are concentrated in the world. There are gobs of hams in Europe. There are quite a few hams in Russia, and they're perfectly willing to speak to you, okay? So you've got Europe, Russia, Scandinavia, which is part of Europe. And there are some down here in South Africa by the way, if you want the spot that's the furthest away from us on the globe, it's somewhere right out here. So South, uh, um, South Africa is uh, far away. In South America, you will find quite a number of hams, lots in Brazil and lots in Argentina. And then as you go over here, there are lots of hams in Japan and lots of hams in Australia. Now, the other parts of the world have hams, but they're far more rare. And so that's why, you know, it's easy working what I call casual DX to work 50 or 60 countries, but to get all the way up to 100 takes some real work because you're going to get the rare ones. I have one from Zaire, um, which is somewhere here in uh, equatorial Africa, um, that I got, there was a U.S. Embassy official who was operating from the embassy there and had his Zaire call sign. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at where you are. You're here, you've got to go this direction. You've got to go this direction. You've got to go up over here. Note that Japan is way up here, almost to the north. Now, I want to point out what's at the top of the poles. This ring right here, is about where, if you look at this, you look at the top of the world, remember that the magnetic field of the Earth comes out of the magnetic North Pole, going to this magnetic South Pole, and it's that magnetic for, 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 lines of force that 
keep the uh, nasty stuff from the sun from hitting the earth. But those lines of force go into the earth up in here in the Arctic. And so sometimes those lines of force will come in here and drag in all kinds of junk from what's called the solar wind. This is what makes Ionis, uh, makes uh, Aurora, Aurora Borealis and the Aurora Australis, even though it has nothing to do with Australia, okay? Now, the problem is that this, the polar regions are difficult to transit um, for DX, for HF. They sometimes will transmit very well, but other times they won't. So you're here, and to get these guys up over in here, you're talking about polar transmissions. Whereas somebody who lives over here, we'll put that in the middle, talking to Europe, is not faced with this polar barrier. That's why it's so much easier on the East Coast to work DX than it is here. And I'm here. I've got exactly the same problem. And if you're out in California, this stuff seems so far away and it's up over the poles. It's very easy to work Japan, very easy to work Australia, okay? So your geography has a great deal to do with the kind of DX that you can work on a casual basis. Now let's go back to the drawing board. Okay, we're back at the drawing board. I want to talk about uh, nighttime and daytime. This is daytime, this is night. You can work DX any time of the day or night, but, but, there are better times. 40 meters, you'll probably work at night. Okay, that means that the path between you and the DX station should be in darkness. And uh, 20 meters is a good daytime band, and somewhat into the evening now, as the sunspot cycle peaks out, we'll get more of this in the evening. You've also got 17, 15, 12, and 10, which tend to be daytime bands, but uh, we're going to find as uh, we get further into the sunspot cycle that they get better. Now, there are, um, you know, I'll just talk about, remember that the sun is the source of the energy that creates the excitation of the ionosphere that allows you to, um, that allows you to work DX, that puts the ionosphere in the right place. There are a variety of solar indices or indexes uh, that talk about how the sun is performing. There are very important things for uh, DX, sunspot activity, uh, geomagnetic storm activity, okay, and um, the sunspot is probably the most important one of that. And then the solar index, the 10.7 centimeter uh, index. And books like this, you can get books like this uh, that will explain which ones are advantageous for you and which ones are not. So from North Dakota, without room for better antenna, uh, you are going to have to uh, start working with these things when there are DX that's available to you. A very good time to work DX is during DX contests. There are two or three or four of these during the year. If you're just using sideband, um, you can use these and DX stations are on the air when they might not normally be on the air, so you can talk to them. Now, um, I think that it's important to remember that the number one rule of ham radio, which is perseverance, is that you have to persevere in this and you have to start really learning the bands. Now, there are uh, websites you can go to that will tell you all about um, what's on the air right now. They're called spotting. Uh, people spot these stations. So if you hear one, you type it into this network so all the hams around the world can see it. So you'll want to sit down with some of your friends from your club who like to work DX and talk about times of day, frequencies, uh, what the sun is doing, and 
and so on, to, so that you can see if you can hear the DX. Now, most hams around the world understand a little English. They understand enough to understand what the Q signals are. QTH in any language means what is your location. So if somebody says my QTH, QTH is um, Paris, France. Okay, QTH Paris, France. That much they can do. Now, a lot of these hams do not speak fluent English. So they like to usually keep their communications quite short, convey the necessary information, and then there's somebody else waiting who wants to work that DX station. Also, timing is everything. You'll note that many DX stations will have a pileup on them. So when you try to break the pileup, you gotta be right at the beginning or right at the end of that pileup. Timing is crucial. You can't wait very much. Now, each DX station is different. Some will draw out a uh, call sign from the beginning, the middle, or the end of the pileup. I have seen DX stations, a pileup settles down, I put my call in, KE0OG, and they'll come back, OG. Often they'll only pick up the suffix on your call, but you then use your entire call. If he has questions about it, answer them quickly. Uh, is that kilo echo? And you go affirmative. Just leave it at that. Or QSL. Because QSL in any language means I have received or you have received. Okay. A QSL card is just simply an acknowledgement that somebody has received something. So there are lots of different factors going into DX. I really, this book happens to be outstanding. Unfortunately, it's out of print. Copies are available, but they're quite expensive. You can tell how old this is. I've got a napkin marking my place on one of my several rereads of the book. And it says United Airlines on it. So I read it on an airline while I was traveling, which I used to do a lot for business. Now, he had, um, Jeff had one last question. He, he says, uh, do I need to buy a better radio? so that I can hear these? The answer is no. The 7300 and the 590SG are pretty much state-of-the-art radios, and spending a lot more money on a receiver isn't going to help you very much. Now, you do want to explore all the features of the radio that will help you, like um, the tuning, the filtering, uh, the uh, bandwidth settings, and so on, to really go after that faint station. We like to tend to listen for the stations that are strong, but DX is often faint, okay? Now, uh, when you work the DX station, it'll be a very quick exchange. He has to get your call sign, location, and signal report. And, and it's an unfortunate thing in ham radio that signal reports for DX and contesting are always 5.9. Um, that means perfect signal. And you hear this often, uh, your signal's 5-9, could you please repeat your free prefix? Well, if the signal was 5-9, you should have begotten the prefix, but it's just one of those things. Uh, sometimes they will tell you their name. Um, sometimes, and I've had this happen, uh, since the prefix goes with just one country, they won't put in their QTH because you can tell it from the prefix. There are lots of different ways of doing it. Now, you mo note that you have an uh, antenna from Alpha Delta, which is a dipole, and unless you have that at one half wavelength for the band you're working on, you're going to find out that much of the radiation will go more up than out. But you also have a high gain AV680, it's a very nice antenna, but it is a vertical, so it's unity gain, uh, but it will put that signal down lower, so it'll go out further. Okay? Now, what do you need to do to improve your receiving? You need a better antenna. That's it. You need a better antenna. Um, look and see if, at, at some of the various hex beams and see if you can fit one of those in your yard. I have one uh, out here, a hex beam. So, uh, and I'll show you a picture of it right here. This is my hex beam. It's out in my backyard. It is a beam, so it does have a rotator on it. Okay, 
This is my hex beam antenna, and I'm out here so that you can get an idea of the size of the antenna. Uh, it's on a 20-foot pole. You'll see that there is a uh, rotator up there and then the antenna at the top. This is probably the antenna that will give you the least in terms of uh, taking up uh, square footage. This is a 20 through 10 antenna. It does not cover 40 meters. Okay, so this can be put in without too much space in the backyard, but I'm fortunate I have an acre here so I can put lots of antennas in. Uh, Jeff, I hope that uh, helps answer your question. Uh, DXing sometimes falls into your lap, but a lot of DXing you've got to go seek it. And in fact, there are a lot of people who think that CQ stands for I seek you. And <laughs> that's a, a joke, but not the real source of the term CQ. Anyway, you will be seek seeking uh, DX stations, mostly you will answer their CQs. You can call CQ DX, but it's very likely you won't get anything back. Most of the people who call DX stations with CQ DX uh, have very powerful stations. But again, that amplifier doesn't help you hear them. It just helps them hear you. So um, keep going at it. It's a very fun part of ham radio, talking to people all around the world with 100 watts uh, or less, okay? And uh, you can have a lot of fun with it. So there you have it. If you've followed this far in this, uh, please subscribe, click like. Um, please also uh, consider the tip jar or Patreon. And until we next meet, 73.